Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless john 15 18 through 20 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would love its own yet because you're not of the world but i chose you out of the world therefore the world hates you remember the word that i said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. A social media post quoting the Book of Romans, a testimony of leaving the gay lifestyle to follow Christ, silently praying outside an abortion clinic. Christians in Europe are facing potential prison time for these so-called offenses. As CBN's Billy Hollowell explains, it's part of a growing trend of threats to freedom of speech and religion. Religious liberty battles spreading across Europe and beyond are sparking fears about if and when these same struggles could come to America. In Finland, a member of parliament is one of the more prominent people on trial for her religious views. It was four years ago, in June 2019, uh, when I posted a Twitter post and also to Facebook. And it was about uh, the Pride event that was going on and uh, that the main church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, uh, decided to support it uh, officially. And it was a shock to me. In questioning the church's support, Pavi Razanin shared a verse from the Book of Romans about same-sex relationships and quickly found herself in a legal battle. Some citizen made a criminal complaint about this uh, Twitter update and uh, then police started to investigate the case. After it came into public, then there became more and more <laughs> criminal complaints about one radio program. Uh, and, and then there was an old pamphlet I had written already 2004 uh, about uh, marital and sexual issues. While unanimously acquitted of charges last year, prosecutors appealed Razanin's case, leading to a second trial. The maximum uh, punishment is uh, two years jail or, or fine. In our constitution, we have the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. Unfortunately, this struggle goes beyond Finland. On the Mediterranean island of Malta, Matthew Gresh, an ex-LGBT activist, faces potential prison time after sharing his testimony of leaving a gay lifestyle to follow Christ. Uh, last year, I was invited to uh, share my story on a program and answer questions about so-called conversion practices. And um, I mentioned an organization as well that supports men and women who leave LGBT and an organization that promotes uh, biblical sexuality. Within days, numerous people reported to police that Gresh violated Chapter 567 of Maltese law, which bans advertising conversion therapy. I had to go to the police and I exercise my right to be silent. The police press charges against me. Gresh says the potential ramifications could be sweeping. If I'm found guilty, I could uh, spend five months in jail or I could, um, you know, pay a fine of up to 5,000 euros in Malta just, just for really exercising my freedom to be a Christian and to support others who want to move away from unwanted LGBT identities or desires, etc. And Andrea Williams with Christian Concern points out how in the UK, abortion clinic buffer zones basically prevent people from assembling, counseling, and even silently praying outside those facilities. And I think it's very hard for nations 
in the West for nations such as America and Great Britain to imagine really that we've reached this far, apart from we have. I think that, he, that, that those that are watching this will think, really, has Great Britain created a space where you are unable to speak quietly, unable even to pray, unable even to walk alongside a woman to explain another way? Consider what happened to UK Army veteran Adam Smith Connor. Last November, officers began questioning him for silently praying outside of a clinic for his own son who had been aborted. So they informed me that um, they considered that my praying for my deceased son was a breach of the PSPO, that it was an act of disapproval of, of abortion, although I wasn't manifesting that prayer in any way. And if, if I hadn't told them, they would have had no way of knowing what I was praying about. It was a, sil a silent prayer in, in my mind. Williams says if Americans don't pay attention, these laws could make their way across the Atlantic. I would like to warn uh, those of you in America to ensure that these, these initially civil measures that, that get placed in and around certain buildings, so in and around abortion clinics, then um, take on a quasi-criminal force. There's also the political pressure that's applied around them. These examples beg the question, could the criminalization of Christianity come to the U.S.? I hope you see where this is all going. After giving this some serious thought, we must understand that it is Christ's followers who are in the way. This is the future the Bible has been warning about. We have arrived, brothers and sisters. Persecution is here. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians, and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is here. So you have a member of parliament. This isn't just an ordinary citizen. This is an elected official. Get charged because she quotes from the book of Romans. And not just charged once, she gets charged twice. She won her first case, but the prosecution wouldn't accept that. Their ideology won't allow Christianity to be expressed in the public square. They, they won't, just, just flat won't do it. And so they've brought yet another case. The island of Malta, you see Christian persecution, people that have come out of a lifestyle, just as, as they did in the first century, the New Testament, such, were, such as you, but you have come out from this. That is going on in traditionally Christian cultures. Well, this is just Europe. Let me draw your attention to a case that was just decided by the Supreme Court where a football coach in Washington State was not allowed to pray in public. He wasn't allowed to go take a knee on a football field and pray. Now, that got decided. That went all the way to the Supreme Court to defend his right for his religious freedom. 
Let's turn to Colorado. There, a baker was absolutely targeted by the state government, and they're taking him to court yet again. That one went all the way to the Supreme Court. They lost there, but their ideology won't allow someone to say, I have the freedom of conscience. I have the freedom of speech. I have the freedom of religion. If we don't have this freedom in the United States, we, we really don't exist anymore. It's all an illusion. If you have these enforced ideologies, this cancel culture, all of these things, and then on top of it, the threat of the state coming after you and litigating, no one has the resources to defend against that kind of power. We need to participate, but we also need to pray, and most importantly, we need to preach Christ and him crucified. When you think of famous psychologists, Sigmund Freud comes to mind, Carl Jung. But today, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Peterson was known as an outspoken intellectual. He said what was on his mind. And most of the time, what he said was controversial. Like in 2017, when Canada tried to criminalize using improper pronouns, Peterson was the face of the resistance. I think Facebook now recognizes something like 71 separate gender identity categories, each of which in principle is associated with its own set of pronouns. And so it's become, well, linguistically, un it's, it's become a parody, essentially. It's become linguistically unmanageable. I just don't understand that. And, and I don't understand how the government can justify imposing a criminal penalty on the use of words that no one either knows or uses. Jordan Peterson had common sense, rooted, though, in deep academic rigor, which alarmed the left because they couldn't academically discredit him. He had the credentials and scholarship they envied. And the more Dr. Jordan Peterson told the truth, as we've understood it for millions of years, he became dangerous. He became a top censorship target in the West. The more he was censored, though, the more popular he became. This was unacceptable. So now Dr. Peterson is being reprogrammed. The Canadian courts and the Canadian psychology boards forcing Peterson to submit to social media training. And if he refuses, he's stripped of his license to practice, essentially canceling him. Why? Because I made political statements that the members of the college don't agree with. I am now going to be required, the college can go ahead with this, to put me into a re-education program until I learn my lesson, whatever that is, regardless of how much time that takes, by their judgment, or they can take my license away. On what grounds? Well, they say when you're a psychologist, you have freedom of expression, but you must abide by the rules that may limit your freedom of expression. Okay, well, who makes these rules? Oh, it's the same academics who believe there's 71 pronouns. They say Jordan Peterson is so unprofessional, he poses a risk of harm to the public. Trudeau's lockdowns didn't harm the public. Jordan Peterson's criticism of Trudeau, that harmed the public. I'm at my daughter's wedding in California. I will never forget, Justin Trudeau, that my father is not here because of your utterly unconscionable, unconstitutional, and vindictive travel ban. Jordan Peterson is being reprogrammed because he had the audacity to ridicule the prime minister. There's a rule, eh? There's a rule, is that right? That the College of Psychologists has that I can't criticize Justin Trudeau on Twitter. That's a rule, is it? And if someone anywhere in the world complains about the fact that I've criticized Justin Trudeau, let's say, that all of a sudden that's a rule, even though it wasn't a rule. And of course I get to criticize Justin Trudeau not only because he richly deserves it in every way you can possibly imagine, but because that's actually what freedom of speech means. Trudeau is not King Charles III, and this is not North Korea. Peterson also dared question climate change models, apparently questioning a scientist who hides his data is blasphemy. There's no such thing as climate, right? Climate and everything are the same word. And I, that's what bothers me about the climate change types. It's like... This is something that bothers me about it, technically. It's like, well, climate is about everything. It's okay, but your models aren't based on everything. How did you decide which set of variables to include in the equation if it's about everything? If it's about everything, your models aren't right. Because mm. your models do not and cannot model everything. Peterson wasn't done. He touched the third rail of culture, transgenderism. Peterson criticized the actor Ellen Page 
who was born female and after surgery now goes by Elliot Page. Quote, remember when pride was a sin and Ellen Page just had her breasts removed by a criminal physician? That got Peterson kicked off Twitter, triggered an intervention by the Canadian government. Peterson says he wasn't speaking in his professional capacity, but the psychology board says he shouldn't even have a voice of his own. He should always, in public, say the things good little well-behaved boys are supposed to say, you know, politically correct things that don't get you in trouble with the culture mafia. The entire episode mirrors what's happening here in the U.S. FEMA workers are undergoing diversity training about white supremacy while they're supposed to be conducting search and rescue in Maui. Dozens of Republicans have been indicted for questioning an election. Americans lost their jobs, their businesses, their reputations during the COVID pandemic. There's a psychological reprogramming going on right now. They tell us Biden wasn't talking business with Hunter's clients. He was talking about the weather. They tell us the laptop's Russian disinformation. Bidenomics is working. Trump colludes with Russia. Millions of Americans accept the reprogramming. Maybe it's convenient for their political cause. Maybe they're just too busy watching Netflix to care. The Bible teaches us not to follow after philosophers and deceivers of the world. As we read in Colossians 2.8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. As we watch world events unfold, it is as if we are all watching the same movie. Yet at the same time, Christians and unbelievers are seeing two separate stories. Christians are watching world events unfold, just as the Bible said it would, right before Jesus returns. Christians long for Christ's return, as we are looking forward to the day He rules and reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We look forward to a day when there will be no more lawlessness, a time of peace and harmony with all creation. Unbelievers, on the other hand, are trying to create their own utopian society, where lawlessness runs unchecked and every kind of evil is thought to be good. Christians have been given the Spirit of God as a gift, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, speaking of the unsaved, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Paul goes on to say this in Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. The unsaved are doing the desires of their father the devil, as we read in John 8:44. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar, and the father of it. The reality at the end of these two stories also have different outcomes. The prophet Daniel put it succinctly, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Which do you choose, everlasting life or shame and everlasting contempt? It's up to you, eternity with God or eternity in the lake of fire. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. I find it very interesting that God destroyed all life on earth with a flood. 
and that he will destroy the earth in the end with fire. While God promised never to destroy all life with a flood again, he never said he wouldn't allow flooding in different parts of the earth. We are seeing unprecedented flooding and wildfires all over the world. I believe God is warning an unsaved and unrepentant world that his final judgments are at the doorstep. Overseas now to the extreme flooding in Europe. At least seven people are dead in Greece, Turkey, and Bulgaria after the region was hit with torrential rain. This morning, parts of Greece underwater with two feet of rain falling overnight, a storm hammering the area for 10 hours. Turkey and Bulgaria also feeling the effects. There have been at least seven weather-related deaths. Cars swept away in the central part of the region. In Turkey, at least two bodies were discovered near the Bulgarian border after a group of people was swept away from a campsite. Cars seen trying to navigate through the flooded streets. Severe flooding left 300 people stranded at this airport in Skiathos. Stu Steverson recording this video of the stairs leading up to his hotel room. It was just a uh, torrential nonstop. This weather disaster coming after a summer of extreme heat and devastating wildfires in Greece, claiming the lives of more than 20 people. In the Greek port city of Volos, cars are washed away like bits of debris. Heavy rainfall and floods are battering a region emerging from the European Union's largest wildfires on record. Extreme weather patterns, the Greek prime minister says, have become the norm. I think everyone realizes there are certain weather phenomena that are beyond our capacity to handle, no matter how many flood prevention tools we have. When an unprecedented volume of water falls, which happens everywhere in the world, we will unfortunately have flooding. I am hoping the meteorologists aren't right, but we know we'll be facing some difficult hours ahead. Emergency services are spread thin and overwhelmed. Survivors are becoming desperate. We called the fire department, the municipality, the prefecture. There is no one. Cars have already been swept into the sea. We will mourn the dead. We have been talking to emergency services and the fire department since morning, and there's complete indifference. People with small children are at risk. We are asking for help. Similar scenes in neighboring Bulgaria. The black region normally a hub for tourists, now an inhospitable disaster zone. Vast areas are in a state of emergency and evacuations are underway, hampered by damaged bridges and closed roads. The resort town of Sarevo was hardest hit, and with predictions of more rain, people are moving to higher ground. In Turkey, at least two people were washed away when floodwaters swept through a camping site in the northwest. Other holidaymakers are missing, search and rescue operations are underway. In Istanbul, heavy rain flooded streets and homes in at least two suburbs. The Disaster Management Agency says more storms are predicted in parts of the country and has issued warnings for flash floods, lightning and strong winds. Forecasters say a heat dome over Europe is causing high temperatures and resulting in extreme weather. Phenomena that can last for days, weeks, even months. This, they say, could become one of the worst floods in Europe in recorded history. On land, on the metro, torrential rains wreaking havoc across Spain. As motorists faced flooded roads, emergency services tended to more than 1,200 incidents in the Madrid region alone, where sudden heavy rain caused chaos after a summer of record temperatures. In Toledo, the capital of the Castilla-La Mancha region, the city's industrial area was inundated. Trains were cancelled, leaving residents and tourists alike stranded. It's really crazy. <laughs> we kept going outside and we were looking at the clouds. We're like, OK, are we going to be safe? What's going to happen? But it just kept raining. And... But even catching a bus proved difficult, as garages were heavily flooded, leaving vehicles stuck amid the mud. In the Catalan town of Alcanar, the downpour turned this rural road into a river, confining residents to their homes, leaving behind a trail of damage in its wake. We organized amongst ourselves to make ropes with towels and bedsheets and use them to pull two young men who were grabbing onto the columns. We pulled them to the top floor and saved them. It was terrifying, very, very scary with small children, women. Nobody showed up. We were left alone to save ourselves. 
While the ferocity of the rains has begun to subside, the damage they caused remains evident and the clear-up significant. Spain's National Weather Service has lowered the alert level from red to yellow, but it is far from normal for many to resume their usual activities in the worst affected areas. Here at home now to the urgent evacuations in a part of East Texas as a wildfire rages out of control. Right now I'm in Walker County about an hour north of Houston where a massive wildfire is burning through more than 3,000 acres and is just 10% contained. Emergency management and fire crews telling us that this is a fast, extreme moving fire. Yesterday, they told us that around 4 p.m. it was 100 acres, and then an hour later, more than 500 acres. 10 p.m., it was over 1,000, and as I mentioned, now this morning, 3,000 acres, just 10% contained. It is working its way through trees and underbrush in a rural part of the community. However, there's still plenty of farmland in homes in the area. Because of that, evacuations have been suggested. At this point, we don't know a cause for the fire. However, Texas is dealing with extreme drought conditions, making the work to contain this fire that much harder. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal, as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. I believe that time has arrived. Luke 17, 26 through 30. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Just in the days of Noah, when God sent a flood, and in the days of Lot, when God sent fire and brimstone to judge mankind, he is about to send his final judgments on a wicked and unrepentant world. We have reached the stage where there is literally no pause between major weather disasters hitting the world. It is just one disaster after another. When times were normal, there would be a major disaster every once in a while. But now we have reached a stage where there's literally no pause between them. Sadly, this is how it's going to be now. It's just going to be one disaster after another. And most people will have absolutely no idea why any of this is happening. We are living in very troubled times and people need hope. We read about that hope in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We also read about those who do not believe in Jesus, are condemned, and love darkness rather than light in John 3.18-20. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. If you have not already done so, I strongly urge you to call upon the name of Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior today. Folks, God is sending us a message, and that message is, you better act now before it's too late to save your soul. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.